<laughs> okay, or they may just reach into their pocket and well, deep breathe deep. <laughs> that, that didn't work too good, right? Okay, or they might discover where did I put my my standards? Here they are. They may discover naturally that there is something that's actually pretty easy to, you know, transfer between people. So, all right. So the standards committee's made this decision. So, so can you please dissem disseminate these uh, the specifications for the standard to the various groups? Okay. So please disseminate the specs. Who's the leader of your group? All right. So now each group only needs to know how to convert this green ball into their own stuff. <laughs> and then stuff back into the green ball, and the green balls can be exchanged between all the different people. Does this kind of make sense? Okay. Now, it gets a lot more complicated than that because if you actually want to send a message, you have to write something on the wall. Okay, so we have to deal with like what language you're using on the wall. But at least it's a green ball, and you all know how to handle green balls. Okay, so this is the problem. And web services is the current incarnation of a possible solution to that problem. Okay, I'd like to thank all of you for the volunteering of the uh, <laughs> today. And now we're going to talk a little bit about all that. This hello world. Hello world. <laughs> awesome. Yeah, I can juggle too, but uh... yeah, that's cool. So. So this, this concept of the of the, of the combination of, of like I want green balls so that if you give me a green ball I'll know what to do with it and please make the ball this size and you know with this type of language and so forth that's like what an API is it's it's the details of what we need to know to talk to each other or a particular, or a particular system and uh, we're going to talk a little bit later about all these words that are down there. Um, but it's, it's, in essence, it's to try and solve the problem of how can you build a system without taking too much time talking with the other guy about what they want? Is there a way to document it so that you can, by reading the specs, actually build the thing and have it work? Okay, this is sort of like the holy grail. Now, it doesn't always work, but we're making progress. So in order to solve this problem, there's lots of different domains to the problem space. There's the data structure, which is where we live. We're all very comfortable with data structure issues because we live in the world of building databases, so we're used to, to that. But messaging choreography is something that maybe we're not so familiar with, which is a sequencing of messages between systems or transport protocols. Yeah, we kind of know about HTTP and FTP and so forth, but there's going to be details in there. Character encoding is something most of us would rather not have to think about. Um, the language, grammar, security, etc. So it is no wonder that our heads hurt, because it really is a lot of stuff, and you have to keep it all in mind. In the language of web services, and in, in, even in EDI to some extent, the, the concept of fields, like we think of fields in the database, is, are referred to as elements, or some, there's other terminology that's sometimes used to mean the same thing as fields. But in every one of these environments, it doesn't matter from 20 years ago till now, there's going to be similar constructs. What, what, how long can it be? What type of data could be? Are there scope ranges? Can it be, has, has to exist, can't exist, there can be more than one of them, can't be more than one of them. Uh, if it's a date, what does a date format need to look like? All that kind of stuff in terms of constraints. Or, like in our case, we're used to value lists. Well, other systems will have similar constructs for defining a set of allowed values that could go into an element. The choreography, is the sequencing of messages. So here I have a simple dialogue. You know, hi, I'd like to log on, here are my credentials. Oh, okay, I know you. Here's a session ID. Thank you. Um, I'd like to get a list of my open orders. Okay, here's your list of orders. Uh, can I get the details on this particular order? Sure, here's everything you need to know about that particular order. And uh, now can you change the status of that order to ship? Yep, we were able to do it. And in order to document the, for example, you must log in before you can change the status of an order, rule has to be documented somehow and then implemented somehow. I think most of you can just read this list. We're probably familiar with the terminology of most of those. Most don't know that. Um, there are different exchange languages that can be used. Um, SOAP and RelaxNG are both XML-based. Uh, um, I'll be talking a little bit more about 
these in particular. JSON is really primarily for JavaScript applications, but it's, um, it's another way of representing data. Uh, EDI is um, kind of all over the map depending on who implements the EDI. There's no standard way of structuring EDI, but, but once you know how the, the basic rules, you can read and, and build it. And then most of us have worked with tablet limited files and other, other forms of exchanging data. Um, just in terms of syntax, in case you haven't seen it, XML looks kind of like what's up on the top. The same data would be represented JSON using text like this. Um, for those of you who are used to writing JavaScript, this looks very familiar because it's a way of encoding the values. Um, but we'll be talking a little bit more about some of the superstructure or infrastructure that surrounds these things and why at the moment, at least I'm still a, an XML guy rather than a JSON guy, but JSON's still very good. Um, all right, so SOAP and REST are the two kind of standard buzzword terms that are used for describing how you can exchange data between different systems, kind of the, the tennis balls, if you will, without getting into exactly what's written onto the tennis ball. Um, SOAP is incredibly structured and very rigorous, and there are all sorts of frameworks around it to verify that your SOAP is valid and conforms to a specification. So if someone was to write, I'll talk about whistles and XML schema and so forth later, but there, these, these are things that are out there. A lot of work's been done on just in terms of building on the, I think Kurt was talking about building on what other people, or what you, actually, what you were talking about, John, building on what other people have done. They put a huge amount of work into figuring out, well, how do I know that this XML I've created will work when it gets to the other side without actually sending it to the other side? Is there a way I can test it before I send it? And SOAP has, even though it's a pain in the butt environment to kind of work with, and if you're coding it at a low level, there's a richness of tools to help you solve that problem. So if the other guys wrote their spec properly, you can validate that your data will work when it gets there. Um, JSON, for example, at the moment doesn't quite have that same level of support. Um, REST, okay, so, so SOAP is a um, packaging of XML, package up a bunch of XML, ship it to the other guy, they'll do something, however they do it, and they'll ship you back some XML in SOAP format. Okay, REST is a, just like a URL, where you send a name value pair string after the question mark. So you have a domain with a question mark. And I'll, I'll show some examples of this. So name equals value and name equals value and name equals value, just in the simple HTTP get typically. And you get back XML. So it's not nearly as structured, but it's a lot lighter weight and easier to implement. Um, encoding and transcoding for most of us is invisible. We don't tend to have to worry about it too much until you deal with the third party who didn't really implement the encoding properly, or they're using a very old system that still has like ISO 859-1 encoding, in which case like the Euro symbol won't work because it doesn't apply to that. Um, any of you have questions about this, I'll be more than happy to bore you to tears with encoding. Uh, there is this notion of namespaces and grammars, which is another one of those sort of eyes glaze over topics in the XML world. But it's absolutely essential to realize that each individual XML-based application is going to have its own grammar that's unique to its own environment. So just like we had the tennis balls flying back and forth before, if, if I've implemented my system over here and I'm able to talk XML, it's going to have my own grammar. So for the FileMaker work, FileMaker world, we have FMP XML result, or we have FM result set. A, a show of hands, are, are, how many of you have dealt with these at all? Okay. Well, if you go export records, and you select XML, that's what comes out, basically. So FileMaker internally has this basic XML structure that's unique to FileMaker. If you go to any other system, they're going to have their own unique representation of their own system. Still going to be XML, could even be soap based, could be anything else, but it's going to be different than what FileMaker has. Okay, and each one of these is going to be um, defined using a particular grammar and a namespace, and that's because a concept like row might exist in both environments. So you have to know are you dealing with the FileMaker row or the Access row, for example, or the, a Google Map um, waypoint. Versus a, I mean, I don't think MapQuest has a waypoint.